Race, violence, identity, policing. Conversations that have been in the pages of The Atlantic since our earliest days as an abolitionist publication. America and Americans look differently than we did in 1857. But the challenges endure. No one knows this better than ta Coates. He is at the forefront of the conversation about race in America. In the last year, he made the case for reparations in the pages of The Atlantic. The story drew huge acclaim and traffic. He's written with special intensity in the wake of 25-year-old Freddie Gray's death in Baltimore, ta hometown. His mom grew up in the same project where Freddie Gray was picked up by cops. NPR journalist Michelle Norris knows these stories well too. In her race card project, Norris asked people to share six words that capture their feelings about race. Over the years, she has collected thousands of cards that reveal deep feelings about race and identity in America. Only Asian when it's convenient. Black babies cost less to adopt. My son's not half, he's double. ta and Michelle join us now to consider the past and present of race in America and what the future looks like from here. Thank you. Wow. So this is an absolute pleasure for me because this is the second time I've been in conversation uh, with Michelle in like the last two months or so. so at least is, on stage. At least on <laughs> stage, right. It's a first for you guys, so I'm sorry you guys missed the last time. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to start out just uh, thinking about uh, Michelle's uh, project, uh, Race Car Project, which is just so, so interesting to me. Before I started uh, writing nonfiction and became a journalist, I actually was aspiring to be a poet. And I always think of these as like, almost like haiku. You know, uh, where folks have to, you know, condense these really complicated ideas in the, into five words, is it, I believe? Six. six words. You get six words, okay, into six words. And one of the things that, that you know, I was thinking about this morning was since uh, 2010, we've had so much happen in this broad category called race. And since you started the project, I, I wonder how you see events reflected in the race car project. For instance, is there an uptick when an Eric Garner happens? Does a tone change a little bit when a Freddie Gray happens? Just, just interested in that. Well, it, it is kind of a barometer. And when people hear about collecting six-word stories, you, you think, well, that, what can you possibly say in six words? But you know, when, when you hear something like, black babies cost less to adopt, which happens to be true, the fee structure associated with adopting black children is less than it is for Caucasian children or really children of any other racial category, that says so much about our value system in America. And so when I look at the inbox every day, it is a barometer when Trayvon Martin was killed in Florida. Mm -hmm. Before that became a national story, it was reflected in the inbox. You remember, it was a couple weeks before wow, it really? became a national story. Really? I was starting to see what's going on in Stanford, Florida, that I'm suddenly seeing all these, these uh, submissions come in around that. But the inbox is interesting, not just when big events happen. What it helps you do is understand the issues around race that are always there. Mm. Because in America, the conversation about race usually is framed around these big, seismic, explosive, explosive moments. But race is really like the wind that's always blowing around us. And so, you know, a submission comes in, hated for being a white cop, from someone who lives in Texas, who says when he walks in a room and he sees people of color, he assumes that they hate him. And that didn't come in around any of these events, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, um, Walter Scott. It just came in on the course of a day with someone deciding that he wanted to unburden himself to talk about what it feels like to be a white cop. So it's a barometer, yes, but it's also sort of a constant barometer that takes the temperature around race in America. And is it kind of service to you as a journalist? Oh, it's a great service to me as a journalist <laughs> because, you know, if I wanted to find, I mean, for instance, if you want, you know, right now when we're talking about policing in America, mm -hmm and the, how young black men are so often the objects of fear mm -hmm. and how that sometimes leads to aggressive policing mm -hmm. and how it has led to the death of several black men who have been on the front pages of the news and in the radio and on television. The person who's often absent from that conversation is the police officer. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get to them for legal reasons. Mm -hmm. um, they're not participating in the conversation. They often have a spokesman, mm -hmm. you know, who, who speaks uh, around these issues. But in the inbox, I can dip into the inbox and I can find 
the police officer who tells his story. Um, and I'm able to then use that as a journalistic tool to say, tell me more. Help me understand what it's like to walk your beat, to order your steps wearing blue every day. So it's a, it's a great journalistic tool. Yeah, I, I think, you know, being in this time right now, you know, if, you know, these sorts of cases have always been happening. You know, these Freddie Grays, these, these Eric Garters. Uh, the difference is, you know, it's been this technological upgrade. It's actually a lot like what happened during the Civil Rights Movement. Um, you know, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, that wasn't the first time the cops decided to beat somebody, you know, for trying to cross the bridge. But suddenly you had this technological upgrade where there were cameras there to show it and broadcast it across the nation. And that, that horrifies people, you know, in, in a particular kind of way. But yet I was listening to you talk, you know, about, um, the police, and one of the things I've been thinking about is how much of our, you know, sort of societal burdens the police are actually asked to take on. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we pay attention immediately, like, when the incident happens. So Freddie Gray's story, or the story of the assault on Freddie Gray, begins with him being, like, arrested at that point. Oh, you know, the story begins long Yes, 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 that. yes, 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 yes. And it's very, very hard to get people to dial back, you know, and say, but wait, wait, what was he arrested for? Why were they there? I mean, the thing I think about all the time, for instance, is, like, so he, Freddie, looks at somebody like a cop mm -hmm. in a way that the cop finds, you know, bizarre or strange or whatever, and then he runs. And I think, well, Freddie might have been, like, late to pick up his kid or, you know, late to meet somebody. And I think about how you could have that same sort of exchange in a different neighborhood and you wouldn't get arrested. Well, that was one know? of the big questions. Why did he run? Right. If he had done nothing wrong, why would he run? And right. if you look at the, the rhythm and the cadence of his life and the reality of his mm -hmm. life and you understand the, the tension between young black men and police officers and understand why he might have taken off, whether he did something or, or not. Right. Um, that's, but the question you asked, what police are asked to do, right. you know, in this moment, we're looking much more at policing. We're looking at the role of police. We're looking now at, at urban neighborhoods, mm -hmm. at how we got here. And I think that is one of the critical questions. And I think that your work has been so important in helping us understand how we got here because in order to make sense not just of what we see around these seismic moments and these tragic deaths but to make sense of the struggle that we still have around race we have to be willing to look over our shoulder yeah and understand yeah. how we got here yeah yeah and that um that is that is difficult to do yeah I, I, I wondered about this i mean my, my approach you know to journalism tends to be very very historical i've liked history you know all my life when i was a kid i was in the, you know medieval europe and that that's so, so I, I have like a natural sort of interest to say okay but you know what what came before you know as a young person you know one of my frustrations is when you would read you know media uh, again you know we had this very very you know straight bias towards now and i wonder as somebody who's worked in print worked in radio worked in television i just want to why is that? Like, where, is the, where does that come from? I think it has particular... Where does what come from? The, 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 the focus on now, like the inability to dial back, you know, like when we talk about something like race, where it has, you know, such a, a huge, you know, importance, you know, and not starting, like, right in the, in well, the immediate. Well, uh, oh, boy, that's a is big question. Is it just question. deadline <laughs> pressure, or is you it... You know, part of it is deadline pressure. Part of it is, is the, the impetus to capture the now, to be current in an age of deadline news, in an age where we're, we're so often getting the news on these small devices, right. you know, which is sort of like snacking on Cheetos. You know, you're catching yeah. like kind of quick news as it right. just is there and it's not necessarily explanatory. But part of it, to be honest, is you know, to look over your shoulder and to, and to look back at the history of race in America, that's gonna cause some indigestion. That's yeah. difficult to do. The, yeah. the, you know, yeah. that is, it's, it's painful. And yet, in order to understand how we got here, you have to do that. I mean, how many of you have read ta epic uh, and seminal piece of journalism called The Case for Reparations, which appeared in the pages of The Atlantic? Thank you. Okay, for those of you who haven't, you have an assignment. You really do need to read this piece because what he does is talk about race in America, but he educates us in a very important way. And the case was called, the, the story was called The Case for Reparations, which, which automatically gets your attention. Reparations, really? He's right. going there? You right. went there? <laughs> but it really could be called How We Got Here, because what you do is you look at housing policy in America right. and how we came to a point where people of color tended to live in certain neighborhoods, tend to live in neighborhoods with lower housing values, tended to live in neighborhoods um, that didn't have sort of all the accoutrements of the nicer neighborhoods. Right. And it happened very intentionally through policy. Uh, policy, decisions that were made by people that we revere. Difficult decisions, painful decisions that were made by people in history that we revere. And so to understand how we got here, you have to be willing to look at some of that. 
Yeah, and it's um. I, I think like one of the things that hampers, you know, if I could even be so rude as to take, you know, issue with, with even the phrase conversation around race is um, there's a kind of passivity to it that doesn't reflect what actually happened. There, there are no human hands. It's, just, it's as though race is just this sort of, you know, natural fact of the world and we're reacting naturally. It's natural that, you know, I don't like you because you're lighter than me or it's natural that I don't like you because your hair is straighter than mine as opposed to looking throughout history and seeing, you know, laws passed, for instance, in 17th century Virginia that says these people go over here, these people go over there for the benefit, you know, of, of another group of people. You know, one of the reasons why I wrote that piece the way I did was I wanted, you know, folks to understand it really didn't have to be this way. You know, it was this way because people made a decision and there were laws passed, there were ideas written, there was actual policy written down. It was not this vague sort of thing. It wasn't like a hurricane hit us. It wasn't like a tornado hit us, you know. Um, it was an active thing that we actually did, you know. And I, I think um, that's tough, you know what I mean? Because I, I think like, like what, what we try to do is we just say, oh, so we're different from each other. And, you know, this conversation around race is really about how people or how communities that are different from each other uh, should better relate to each other. You know, in my case, is in fact, you know, that, that's not what it is. It's about how uh, communities, you know, two different, two human communities have been made to be different from each other intentionally. Well, you talk, I'm not checking my email, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I pulled this out because there was a, there was a quote that you had. Um, it's, it's actually part of the writing in your piece that I thought captured, I anticipated that we might land here and captures what we're talking about. You know, ta you, 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 you say that it's difficult for us to look back at history and to really, not necessarily atone, but even to understand. You note that in America there is a strange and powerful belief that if you stab a black person ten times, the bleeding stops and the healing begins the moment the assailant drops the knife. We believe white dominance to be a fact of the inert past, a delinquent debt that can be made to disappear only if we do not look. Yeah. Um that's, um, so you write something and you, know, you sort of put it to the side, you go through the editorial part, then you hear it run back to you and it hurts a little bit actually. Um, because you have to distance yourself from it while you're writing it. Um, this is like, I mean, it's not so much a flaw in our, in our civil rights movement or in our civil rights legislation, it's a flaw in us stopping uh, the civil rights legislation. It is, um, I think, you know, again, if I can be rude, it really is the flaw of equality. And the idea is that if you just make all the laws equal, then, then the work is done. But if you actively have damaged somebody, you know, through, you know, other laws for a long, long period of time in America, you know, and, and certainly if you're talking about pre-America in the colonial time, I mean, you're actually talking active centuries of damage that benefited other group of people. Just making it equal, my argument in that piece, is not enough. Um, you know, you can break somebody's legs and you know, give them a bad pair of running shoes and bring them up to, you know, the starting line and say, well, the distance you have to run is equal, right? but you broke the boy's legs before he had to run. You know what I mean? And so it, 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 you know, it's a kind of fallacy that we have, and I think it's really, really particular to the African-American community, because the African-American community is segregated, and I think this is different for other groups that find themselves uh, in trouble. Because we're segregated, it becomes difficult to get access to other things, you know? And, and yet to move forward, though, it requires that the African-American community, and really communities in color, of color, engage right. um, with white America. Right, yes, it does. And one of the, the and, and you asked about the benefit of the race car project. One of the benefits for me in the race car project is that it is a conversation that includes white Americans. Right. Because so often the conversation about race does not. Right. I mean, frankly, it's sort of amazing that we have a room full of people here to listen to a conversation about race. Because often when you say, I mean, I, I used to joke in the newsroom that if you wanted to clear the conference room, you could say, let's have a conversation about race. And people would be like, oh, look at the time. <laughs> you know, I have another meeting I have to be to down the hall. Um, because it's a difficult conversation to have. And yet you have to figure out how to engage people in order to move the country forward, in order to move us all forward. And part of the issue, I think, is the terminology. I think maybe we need new terms to talk about race. Because even the word race, when you hear the word race, you often think, well, that's about them. Mm -hmm. That's a conversation right. about, about people of right. color. That doesn't include me. Right. And maybe it's a conversation about identity. Right. You know, even the word post-racial. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know, I wonder if, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on this, if at the beginning of this administration, when we were, you know, there was all this sort of post-racial high-fiving um, about America moving to this wonderful new place, mm -hmm. if instead someone, the media, someone 
in politics, someone in history, you know, a history of sociologists, should have been perhaps saying, whoa, put your seatbelts on. Yeah. Because the road ahead will most likely be difficult because of this historic yeah. milestone. And it probably was, but we weren't listening. <laughs> I wasn't saying that. I definitely wasn't listening. I, I think, you know, one of the things that happened, and, you know, I think I can be a little forgiving here, is, well, did you expect to see an African-American president in your lifetime? Was that an expectation you had? You know, I'm an optimist. Um, I keep oh. saying that. It's what gets me out of bed in the morning sometimes. I, I, I thought it was a possibility, and yet I was deeply surprised right. when it happened. Okay. And I was definitely raised by, you know, black folks who never right. expected to see right. it. So. so I never thought it was happen, would it happen, and I was deeply surprised. I mean, it's one of the most, probably, arguably the most incredible, you know, national event I've witnessed in, in my lifetime. And I think people didn't know what to do. I mean, people, I mean you know, and, and I, even in the African-American community, I mean, there were all these riffs, you know, among, you know, comedians before Barack Obama about, like, what it would happen if there were a black president. Just because it was so far off, you know? It just, just had no, like, the idea that this would happen. And then for it to happen, and yet, if you look at the socioeconomic statistics, mm -hmm. you know, for nothing to change, that, I, I think there's a fallacy in there that says, well, one man should be able to change, you know, all the socioeconomic statistics. But the fact of the matter is, you, you come to grips with the fact that, you know, we are in a world right now, um, which is different from our parents in the sense that African-American individuals who are really, really gifted can go really, really far. You know, and really, really lucky. Let me add that. Who are really, really lucky and really good that can go really, really far. So you can see somebody. They can sometimes make their luck. Right. In ways some, that yes, they, yes, they the can. Past. Yes, they can. And that was not really on the table, you know, for, for mm -hmm. our ancestors. And yet, for the vast majority of Africans, you see this, still this, this broad, broad chasm, 20 to 1 uh, uh, wealth disparity, uh, the incarceration statistics, which just, I mean, are, you know, completely, completely out of this world. Um, but I think you're on to something when you say we, we have to stop. I mean, it really, this is an American problem. I mean, arguably the central American problem. It gives us, you know. Point, an American yeah, problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, and so it can't just be us. You know, it's not just going to be us sitting over, you know, in our little black student union getting this figured out, you know? So what was different about this year? What, how is it that this year was the year that we saw so many stories that involved, um, the killing of black men at the hands of yeah. police, the, the protests around that, the uprisings around that. And, and as part of this question, I want to ask, we both have sons that are the same mm -hmm, age. Mm -hmm. And I know that we've talked about this growing up and the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the talk, you've heard about the talk mm -hmm. that you would get about how to comport yourself mm -hmm. um, when you interacted with white America, but most particularly when you act, interacted with police. Mm -hmm. So our sons watch this. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't feel like, you know, we both have ties to Baltimore. You're right. from Baltimore. Right. My husband's from yep. Baltimore. Yep. We're in Baltimore all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And the kids see this and they feel a direct, even though their lives are different. Right. They attend different schools. There's a connection. So what, you know, how do we engage with our kids about this? And we're talking about our kids, but, you know, how should, how should we all engage with our kids about this? But for us in particular, you know, what do you tell your son? Um... You know, I have an answer that I don't know is applicable to everybody else's children. Um, I tell my son everything. I tell my son everything. Um, I have, and I've always told him everything. Mm -hmm. um, and what does that mean? You, you, you don't sugarcoat it. You say no, this is what you no, should no, expect? No, 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 I don't sugarcoat it. And, and I think like, this is actually this is a very, very interesting thing. Because one way of thinking about it is, you know, how do you make your kids hopeful? You know, how you make them healthy, you know, positive thinking individuals. Right. If you tell them, listen, this, this is what the world is, and it probably, you know, will not change very significantly in your lifetime. Um, which is the condensed elevator picture probably of a lot of what I tell him. Um, and that is, I think, that you have to, you know, get a hold on the idea of struggle. And, you know, I, I say this all the time, but for the vast majority of African Americans who have struggled in this country, for the vast majority of people who have struggled for any cause in this country that, you know, lasted any sort of long period of time, failure is the norm for the vast majority of them. Somebody like Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King, uh, Frederick Douglass, people that actually got to see momentous change in their lifetime, this is, like, abnormal. The normal is that you give yourself to something that is beyond your lifetime. And I think there's and something that, beautiful that someone about beyond that. you will reap the benefit. Yes, 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 yes. Because someone beyond you, someone before you, 
you know what I mean, sacrifice for something that they wouldn't see themselves, you know? And, and I actually think there's something really beautiful and noble in that. So how do you, put, how do you give that message? If you want your, you know, the thing that I always struggle with is how if you want your children to soar, you don't want to put rocks in their pockets, right? right. You don't want to weigh them down. Right. And yet you want them to understand the struggle and embrace the struggle. I mean, I know that I grew up in a house, <laughs> I still hear, hear this from my mother sometimes, did Harriet get tired? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Meaning Harriet Tubman. I love you know? that, though. That's what you should say. I love <laughs> did, that. Did she get tired? I love that. Yeah. You know? Right. <laughs> Which is like, you right. know, pick it up. That's so. something I would say. I like that a lot. <laughs> I'm a fan of that. No, I, I think, you know, saying, you know, struggle for something beyond your lifetime is not a I think it's actually, you know, a far be it for me to use this word. I think it's actually a deeply spiritual centering concept. Um, and I, I hope. I think it's like, you know, your, your children are always works in progress. But my theory, my theory is that it actually will help them soar. And you know, they will this, pull this us commitment. forward. Yes. And yes, they yes, will pull yes. us forward. Yep. And we look forward to the book that, you're, uh, that you've just completed, yes. which includes a number of messages to your son, mm -hmm. essays to your son. Mm -hmm. In the short mm -hmm. time that we have left, do you want to talk just a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, I have a new book coming out September 7. Everybody buy it. <laughs> <laughs> it's entitled Between the World and Me, and actually the entire book is a, a letter to my son. Um, God, I hate saying this, but for lack of a better term, giving him the talk. <laughs> Don't tell anybody I said that. <laughs> Tanahasi, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you, guys. Thank you.